Good afternoon. So glad to see you all here today. Um, I'm Doug Edgton. I'm the president of the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, and we are uh, thrilled to have the second annual, uh, hopefully we'll have a third and a fourth and a fifth, but uh, gathering of this group. It has it, Last year was very, very successful, and we, we are pleased to, to see the growing numbers in the community. Uh, today, you know, as we, we look around the, uh, the sector right now, we have growing numbers of companies. And uh, fortunately for us, we've got the head of the uh, economic table uh, for the state of North Carolina because Senator, I mean, Commissioner Troxler leads the, uh, the, largest ag the largest sector of our economy at $78 billion a year. The agricultural industry is a big driver for our state. And we like the, the fact that ag and ag biotech intersect because when we look at the things that we're doing in the biotechnology sector, that's a $73 billion economic impact on the state. So the, the two combined together are major drivers for our state's economy. A large number of people are employed because of that. Uh, we are thrilled with the growth that has occurred in this, in this ag and ag biotech sector over the last um, you know, 20 or 30 years. It's been incredible not to mention the history of our agricultural uh, enterprise in the state of North Carolina. But uh, I'm here to introduce Commissioner Troxler, and that's uh, one of the, the privileges we get to do every once in a while. So he was uh, raised in Guilford County uh, at Brown Summit, which I'm very familiar with, having lived in Winston-Salem for a long time. He spent his entire career in agricultural uh, product development, and he's the owner of Troxler Farms. Over the years, the family has produced tobacco, wheat, vegetables, and soybeans. And since taking office in 2005, Commissioner Troxler has focused on developing new markets for North Carolina family uh, for farm products. And what he's trying to do is keep the family farms working, keeping giving them things that they can take to the marketplace, and it, it is a, a way to protect the nation's food supply. So, uh, Commissioner Troxler has also been active on the national level. And here's where I'm really going to have to read because he does a lot of stuff. I mean, this guy is very, very, very busy. So he's active on the national level. He is the past president of the National Association of the State Departments of Agriculture and the former chairman of the association's Food Regulation and Nutrition Committee. He was honored with the 2015 NASCDA Award for his commitment to food safety. He was the president of the Southern Association of State Departments of Agriculture. For his work in farming and for the public, as, as a public servant, Commissioner Trox Troxler has been recognized numer with numerous awards he received a 2015 Distinguished Alumni Award from NC State College of Ag and Life Sciences, which is pumping a lot of graduates into our economy. And uh, in fact, uh, Jim Bloom from Bear said that they have 72 degree people working at Bear uh, Crop Sciences with NC State degrees. So we're very pleased to hear that. He's the, he won the Friend of the River Award from the Land and Sky Regional Council. His support for agritourism and several major tourist projects in the state earned him the 2014 Public Service Award for the North Carolina Travel Industry Association. And other recent honors include the 2013 Forest Conservationist of the Year Award for the North Carolina Wildlife Foundation, the Meritorious Service Award from the North Carolina Soybean Producers Association, the Alec Grossner uh, Food Safety Award for the Association of Food and Drug Officials, the Distinguished Service Award for the North Carolina Agricultural Foundation, and the Leadership Award for the Western North Carolina Livestock Center and Western North Carolina Communities. So he is eminently qualified to speak to you today. <laughs> I think he's got the awards to prove it. But the, of all the things I think he's probably most proud of is his family. And Commissioner Troxler uh, spends a lot of time when he can. Obviously, he doesn't get a lot of time. But with his wife and their two sons, and they have two daughters-in-law and five grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming uh, Commissioner Steve Troxler. Thank you, sir. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today and especially thank the Biotech Center for keeping North Carolina at the forefront of biotechnology uh, and agribusiness. Uh, you know, it's quite a treat to, to know that we have this kind of support in North Carolina for our agriculture and agribusiness industries. And the first thing that I get to do is be the bearer of good news today. Doug mentioned the $76 billion industry that we have in North Carolina called agriculture and agribusiness. And 
According to the latest figures from uh, Dr. Mike Walden, we're now an $84 billion industry. So that is quite a jump. But we're not through, and if you can see that uh, growing agriculture and agribusiness to a $100 billion industry through partnership, that's my goal. Uh, the people at the department get on me sometimes for putting unrealistic goals out there to try to meet. Uh, the first of those was the state fair. Uh, I said, you know, in a couple years, we're going to have a million people come to this state fair. And I challenged everybody to do what we had to do to get that done. Well, three out of the past six years, we've had over a million people visit the state fair. So if you don't set really high goals and you don't put a deadline on it, people tend to procrastinate and they wait till the last minute to do it anyway. So go ahead and put it out there and let's get started and let's get it done. So they didn't understand that this $100 billion goal was not quite as lofty as they thought. What I know is these figures stay about a year and a half behind. So when I challenged uh, North Carolina to be a $100 billion industry, I knew I had six and a half years to do it because these are the 2014 figures. So it's not going to be as hard as it seems to get there, and, and I really believe that we can. Uh, I'm under, I understand that I'm kind of pinch-hitting for Michael Skews, who is now the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and that's a good thing. Michael and I happen to be good friends, and uh, he's the former Commissioner of Agriculture for Delaware. Uh, he's been down to visit with me at the State Fair, and he's actually spent the weekend, he and his wife spent the weekend with Sharon and I at our farm, so he does like North Carolina. And I have told the biotech center the, the draw that it takes to get him here. And I told them all they got to do is promise him a good thick steak, uh, followed by a good cigar and a glass of brandy afterwards, and he'll come anytime. So I can assure you that he'll, he'll be on down here. Uh, but he is a, a, a great leader and uh, somebody that I am proud to call a friend. The last time I called him, I called him after he was uh, appointed deputy secretary to congratulate him. Uh, and he listened intently, and he said, Troxler, he said, most of the time when you call me, you either want a check or you want me to solve a problem that nobody else can solve or you want to go hunting. I said, Michael, you have a good understanding of your job description. So we, <laughs> we've got an understanding on that. I said, you missed one thing, though. North Carolina's check has always got to be bigger than other states' check, and you will be a perfect Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. So we're well on the way toward doing that, I think. Uh, I'd like to know who I'm talking to. Uh, how many of you in here raised the food that you ate today? Rolling. Thank goodness. <laughs> I congratulate you for that. But how many of you ate today? You're part of agriculture and agribusiness in North Carolina, and a very important part of that. And uh, the ones of us that actually grow the food supply are about 2%. Uh, that's a small number of people to produce a $100 billion industry, but it's just not the farmers. It's all of the people that, like you, that participate uh, in agribusiness in North Carolina. So uh, I like to draw a correlation to that figure. If you look at developing countries around the world or underdeveloped countries, what you find is the number would be reversed in this room today, which means that the people in these countries are spending all of their time making sure that they and their family have something to eat. So we have it really good in the United States. We have developed this wonderful food supply system that is not only nutritious, it's affordable, and it's safe. Uh, and what it's allowed us to do in this country is to leave the farm and go do other things just as many of you have done over many, many generations. So uh, it's a good correlation to look at, and, and we are the efficient uh, farming people of the world here in the United States. There's one thing that I always like to tell people, and I think I can back it up for sure today. Hungry people are mean people, right? Well, the United Nations has said it much more eloquently than I do in my southern vernacular, but what they say is that if we don't feed the world's population, then what we're going to see is the things that civil uh, societies don't want. You're going to see political unrest. You're going to see crime. Uh, all kinds of things are going to happen that we don't want to happen. 
So the projections of needing uh, 50 to 100 percent more food by the year 2050 to feed the world's population is a great economic opportunity for us in agriculture and agribusiness. But somewhere along the line, we've also got a moral responsibility to do it efficiently enough that people can afford the food supply. Uh, it's easy for me to stand up here today and say, yes, we can meet that goal of 50 to 100 percent more food by the year 2050 if we have some things cooperate with us. But if you can't afford it, then there's no market for the food and the whole thing's going to collapse and then we're going to have mean people all over the world. This weekend, I was at the Got to BNC Festival and I walked in the office uh, Sunday morning and there was a newspaper article laying on my desk. And what that article said was, food shortage fuels political unrest in Venezuela. So I said, okay, I knew what I was talking about. But, you know, that is the truth. And they went on to talk about the, the president down there and the policies that he had instituted, especially uh, not letting uh, Venezuela do a lot of trade with the United States, uh, especially in agricultural products. So uh, these are the kind of things that we fight uh, over and over again. And, you know, we've got to be able to, to meet the challenges. You know, I look back at the history of agriculture and agribusiness uh, in this country, and, and there are some milestones that I have seen uh, through history and in my lifetime that have propelled us today to be able to feed 155 people per farmer. And I think the first of those was the Morrill Act back in the 1860s that created the land-grant university system that uh, started agricultural research. And then in the 1890s, we had an addition to that that established uh, universities like A&T State University. So these two things started us on that, that pathway of being able to do agricultural research and began that pathway of being able to not have to be so dependent on the farm for the food supply. And we began that and we, done, we had done really good with that and along came the Industrial Re uh, Revolution uh, and we had tractors and we had trucks and we had combines. That put us to another plateau uh, in agricultural production. And we actually plateaued there for quite some time. And, and I'm an antique tractor collector and antique farm equipment. And we added bigger tractors. We added bells and whistles. We put air conditioned cabs on them. But for the most part, the farm equipment just got larger and not a lot of innovation that ever happened. So we, we got the, 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 the Industrial Revolution benefits in agriculture. In fact, uh, I kind of have to laugh. I heard a, a talk show one time, and they were asking the, the guy that was talking, said, if you were going to point your children in a direction for a career, what would it be? He said, I would absolutely tell them to go into agriculture because it's a wide open field, and just look what the future is going to be. And I joked in a speech one time, I said, you know, uh, this guy said that he thought that the, the farmers would be the ones driving the Lamborghinis and the porches in the future. And I said, well, I haven't seen them line up to order them because they don't have trailer hitches on them, so what good are they? <laughs> but then a guy came up afterwards and he said, uh, I'm a tractor collector. I want to show you a picture of my Lamborghini tractor. And I have since, uh, since seen them in Europe. Uh, Porsche also makes it, was a tractor company that made tractors in Europe. So uh, we've had some innovative things happen, but when you can drive a Porsche tractor or a Lamborghini tractor, you know, you're pretty upscale. Uh, I, have, I have never seen that, but it, it is kind of funny that, uh, funny that that happened. Well, after we plateaued, another thing happened. Uh, we developed biotechnology. And biotechnology is that real big plateau that's going to propel us to the future. And, and I think we've only scratched the surface. Uh, I've seen a lot of technologies in visiting some of the companies that, that you have that are really exciting. Uh, there's things happening that I never thought I would see, ever. Uh, we're a tobacco state. And we've been known for growing tobacco worldwide for a long time, but everybody knows that has declined. But now we've got a tobacco that will produce 60% uh, sugar to make ethanol. Uh, and if that fails, there's some people in the mountains that would love to have it for the sugar content to make ethanol that we have been familiar with in North Carolina for a long time. So there, there's a lot going on. Uh, I have some, go some other goals other than the, the $100 billion uh, level. And one of those is to help position this industry for the future. Uh, 
And the technology will take us a long ways. There are other things that will take us a long ways, but I want to tell you a couple things that are, uh, that are going to have to happen. I had a uh, ag econ professor in college uh, many, many years ago, and he made a, what I thought was a profound statement at that time. What he said was that you think the weather is going to be the determining factor of the success and failure of agriculture. And having been a farmer, you know, there are bad things that happen with the weather. It's always too hot. It's always too cold. It's always too wet, and it's too dry. So, you know, that I was a little bit skeptical. But what he went on to say was agricultural policy will actually be the deciding factor in success and failure. And if you think about it, agricultural policy has told us in the past what we're going to grow, where we're going to grow it, uh, in a lot of cases, the price of it. And then you get into the politics of the policy. We learned that agricultural embargoes uh, are not a good way to do business uh, many, many years ago. So. I've begun to realize over, uh, especially after becoming commissioner, that this is absolutely true. But I want to add something to what he said. The way we will be successful in the future are those two things, but you've got to put agricultural research right there. And if you think back to how we got to feeding 155 people per farmer, it's almost all agricultural research. The weather is a constant, and, and they say there may be climate uh, climate change and the, the climate's going to warm. Well, if it does, we got to deal with it. We work outside. And you folks can help with that with the technology. And it's going to be research that will propel us to be successful. There's no question about it. And, and there, we've all got to advocate for private and public uh, research and partnerships if we're going to continue to be successful in the future. There's things that we do and advocate for in the department every day that we think are going to be uh, instrumental in propelling us into the future. And part of it is just simple infrastructure that uh, we've got to have. Uh, one of the things we do is try to protect uh, prime farmland in North Carolina with the Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund. In fact, I just had a board meeting today. Uh, and we are trying to make sure that we have the natural resources available to us as farmers in the future to be successful. We know that they're going to decline. We know that we're going to have less land mass uh, to grow the crops on. Uh, we know that uh, there's going to be strains on water. There are going to be strains on inputs that we use to grow these crops. So we've got to craft policy now that takes care of these things, and this trust fund is one that works especially with the natural resource side. We've also got to have the human resources to be able to do this. Uh, young, getting young people into agriculture and agribusiness is not as easy as you would think it would be, uh, especially as on the farming side of, uh, of agriculture, and I think everybody's got to remember that all of this that we do starts with a farmer every day. Uh, we have an average age of a farmer in this state at 58 years old, and I'm a little bit above that. And I had two sons uh, that I raised on the farm. One is now an attorney at NC State. The other is a minister. They're not coming back. I've got five, five grandkids, and I hope there is one that would love to farm out of that group, but, you know, who knows. But that's the, one of the challenges that we face uh, also. Uh, also. Keeping international markets open to our products is something that we always have to be cognizant of and, and work to that end. Uh, and 95% of all of the miles to feed fall outside the borders of the United States. So what we do in the department is we are very big on international marketing. Uh, we have an international uh, trade office in Shanghai, China, and we take people from North Carolina, business people all over the world on, on trade missions, and we bring in, inbound trade missions to North Carolina. And I'm proud to say that in the past 11 years, we have doubled agricultural exports out of North Carolina to over $5 billion. We need to double that again in the next five years uh, to keep these markets open. And with the efficiency we have in agriculture, if we don't concentrate on marketing, we're going to have a situation kind of like what we've got now we got plenty of product, but it's cheap product. We've got to open these markets and keep these markets open. To be able to get the market, the, the food and agriculture that we have to the market, we've got to have infrastructure. We've got to have rail infrastructure. Uh, we've got to have transportation infrastructure for trucks. But even maybe more importantly than all that, we've got to have ports 
to be able to get this product around the world. One of the things that we have concentrated on has been uh, ports in North Carolina. And I like to tell people that we in North Carolina miss the boat on ports. Uh, if you think about Charleston, Norfolk, Savannah, uh, we've had two good ports that we have not done anything with in a long, long time. They've just kind of sat there and, and we haven't paid attention to them. But now we want to export product. The cheap way to do it is send it out of our ports. We were in... Uh, Beijing, uh, one night, a, a group of about 30 agricultural and agribusiness people, and we had seen ports all over China, and we knew we had to come home and go to work on that, and we have. The ports now have, the Wilmington port now has coal storage for the meat products that we're producing in North Carolina. We're number two in uh, pork production. We rank number two in all poultry in the United States, and we've got two ports, so why don't we use them? We are very high, highly ranked in forestry products uh, in North Carolina, and they, there's a big export market out there, particularly for wood chips, uh, wood pellets right now, to go to Europe to produce power. So why don't we use our ports? Uh, we've shown the figures that we can save companies probably up to uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, by using the ports in North Carolina, and that's profit to their bottom line. So that's, we've concentrated on, on doing that and, and been successful at doing it. Our lab system at the uh, Department of Agriculture is very important to uh, agribusiness and, and agriculture in North Carolina. We actually have five labs. Uh, we have the uh, veterinary lab, the pesticide lab, the food and drug lab, the standards lab, and the uh, motor fuels lab. These labs average 43 years old, and you can imagine those of you that have labs trying to operate uh, electronic equipment in a building that you can't maintain uh, temperature and humidity in. So luckily during the bond issuance, we got $94 million to combine and make these labs efficient and modern. We're starting on that process. That's going to be really important for all the ag industries in North Carolina, and it's important to everybody. Uh, you want to get a gallon of gas when you pay for a gallon of gas. Well, we have to have a lab to be able to do that. So we're excited about that possibility to be able to move forward. Dean Richard uh, Linton's. Uh, initiative on the Plant Science Initiative is another one of the futuristic things that we're going to do in North Carolina to keep North Carolina in, in the forefront of, uh, of plant science. Now, we are primarily a, a livestock state, and all the chickens, all the hogs we produce, produce <coughs> billions of dollars. In fact, 66% of our farm gate receipts are their animal based. But guess what these animals eat? Plants. So we've got to be efficient in being able to, uh, to be able to do that. Um, I am extremely pleased to say that I am optimistic about the future of agriculture in this state. Uh, with the partnerships that we have uh, and the policy work that we're doing, uh, with the great people that I have working in the Department of Agriculture, uh, I can safely say that we're going to be we're going to continue to be a national leader for many many years to come. Uh, I do have a theory on agricultural economics that I would like to share with you, uh, not as a professor but a farmer. My theory of agricultural economics is if you put a good profit margin in front of a farmer, he will farm his way out of it just as quickly as he can <laughs> by overproduction. That's market response. That's what we do best. So as a grandfather, uh, I have a lot of responsibility. Uh, I want this, the future for my grandkids to be as bright as what we've had uh, sitting here today. I want the world's food supply to be adequate so that we don't have mean people in the world. And I just want to make sure that uh, we remain the number one industry in North Carolina for a long, long time to come. Uh, I want everybody to help me put this message out here. Agriculture and agribusiness is the number one industry in this state. We employ 886, 686,000 people in North Carolina, and it's an $84 billion industry headed to $100 billion shortly. Thank you for this opportunity today, and I hope you enjoy the social. And unfortunately, I have another meeting that I must get to now, so I would beg your indulgence and just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.